You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 24, in the message from the true and faithful witness, Jesus Christ himself, to the church of Laodicea, a people living under judgment. In the book of Revelation 3 and 24, are you there? The Bible says, Because thou sayest thou, that thou art rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and we know not that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is the condition of God's church right now. We are wretched, miserable, poor, we are blind, and we are naked. And the Bible defines in clearer language what it means to be a wretched man in the book of Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. We are told there, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of what? Death. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? The wretched man is a man that is dead in his trespasses and sins. Now, how do you remedy a condition like that? Because the wretched man is a man that is dead. How do you remedy that condition, brothers and sisters? Because the Bible says in I, what is it? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, rather, chapter 9 and verse 6, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not what? How do you wake up a dead man? How do you do it? Go with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. Father in heaven, as we look at your word, I ask that your Holy Spirit will open up our understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, please, when you have it, say amen. It's not just because I want to hear people say amen. I just want to make sure that you're there with me so that I can keep on going. Amen. The Bible says in Ezekiel, chapter 37, beginning at verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were what they were very dry you know where a valley is located don't you a valley is situated between two mountains. In the Bible, a mountain stands as a symbol of a kingdom. We are looking at a people that are betwixt two kingdoms. They're neither good worldlings or good Christians. They're lukewarm and they're dead. The Bible says, and their bones are very dry. You know what's inside the bone, don't you? Marrow. You know what's in the marrow, don't you? Those red blood cells that bring life. Says these people have been dead for a long time. All dried up. Matter of fact, if you go to the book of Proverbs chapter three, you know what it says. A merry heart doeth good like a what? But a broken spirit dries up the bones. I think we have a broken spiritual problem. And when we look at the scripture here in Ezekiel, go back with me now, verse 3, Ezekiel 37 and verse 3. As Ezekiel, the prophet of the Lord, beholds this scene of these many dry bones. It says, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? Look at the prophet's response. And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. See, the prophet understood the situation he was dealing with. Man does 
not have the ability to resurrect man from the dead. When the Lord made the appeal to him, what can be done about these bones? Do you think they can live? He didn't say, you know, hold on a second. Let me call a board meeting. He didn't say, you know what? Maybe we need to throw a youth rally and get as many drums in. Maybe get us some jazz music. Get all the best singers that we can find. Maybe we need to place the gospel in a video game. Maybe we need to read the Purpose Driven Life and get some information from the evangelicals. Maybe they can help us. He said, Lord, thou knowest. Only God knows how to remedy the sin condition. And there's no tricks that we can take from under our sleeve that will have any effect. And as the Lord acknowledged the wisdom of his servant, verse 4 says, And he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, only the word of God can save us from our sin. Bible goes on to say in verse 5 Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones Behold I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and I will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord but look at verse 7. Look at verse 7, brothers and sisters. Pay close attention to verse 7. It says, so I prophesied as I was what? Not as I thought up in my own mind. But as I was commanded by who? The Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Oh, brother, this, brothers and sisters, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. The Bible says that when he prophesied, there was a noise. That word noise in the original Hebrew from whence it was translated means that when he prophesied, there was a crying, and the crying was in a loud fashion. Did you hear that? And this crying that went forth in a loud fashion, it caused a shaking amongst those bones. Well, what crying that could go forth in a loud fashion would agitate such a change in these dry bones? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58 beginning at verse 1. Isaiah 58, beginning at verse 1, when you have it, say amen. amen. The word of God says here, cry aloud, spirit not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, not a flute, not like a harp. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. It is only when we come face to face with our sin condition that God can remedy our dead spiritual state. Oh, brothers and sisters, but when you begin to cry aloud and speak about the sins of God's people, when you begin to cry aloud and talk about the transgressions of Jacob, the remnant, a shaking takes place. That's why you start seeing people start moving around in their seat when you start saying things. See the ministers start putting their hands to their noses and coughing. Yes, sir. Looking to the left and right. You know why? You know why? 
because it makes you feel uneasy that somebody's touching on the sin. You ever had, you ever had a bad cavity before? Yes. You ever had a bad cavity before? Brothers and sisters, I've had a bad cavity before. I'll tell you right now. You touch that cavity, some way, somehow, I can find it to the top of your house without stairs. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, it will make me jump. But the situation still has to be addressed. Because if that cavity is not addressed, do you know what will happen? I'm going to continue in pain. You know what else will happen? Other teeth in my mouth will get rotten. You know what else will happen? The poison from that cavity will seep into my system. It can even contaminate my heart and cause heart failure and I can die. Now that's a fact. But somehow we think that we can go along without addressing our sin problem and we're going to make it right until the gates are signed. Brothers and sisters, We're not living in the time of smooth things. The beast is coming. The mark of the beast is coming. Oh, if you don't want to grapple with God right now like Jacob, that you might gain the victory over the sins that you have in your life, whether they be hereditary or cultivated, you will fall when the Jordan swells. Do you understand what I meant by that? You will fall when the enemy comes. Let me speak in clear language because all of us are not Bible scholars as of yet. We need to deal with our situations, amen? And I know God has a message for us this morning. So before we get into our message for this morning, as it is my tradition, I ask you to do two things. Number one, please pray for yourself. Brothers and sisters, we need the Spirit of God. The only way that you can understand spiritual things is by the Spirit of God communicating them to you. The only way that you can obey the voice of God is if the Spirit of God empowers you to will and to do of the pleasure of the Father in heaven. We need the Holy Spirit. And once again, please pray for myself because I'm standing in the need of prayer. I'm going to kneel and pray at this time. If you're inclined to do so, you can kneel with me. If not, I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to give you 60 seconds to pray for yourself. Ask the Spirit of God to come and speak with you. Talk to the Lord intimately, personally. Put it all at the foot of his throne. And then I'll close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, our maker and our king, I, num I humbly kneel before you and I come, not by myself, but with thy congregation. My Lord, we give you thanks for your mercy endured forever. It is only because of your mercies that we have not been consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. Your love is matchless. Your power is incomprehensible. Thou art worthy to be praised. All glory and honor and majesty belongs unto thee and to thee alone. You are worthy to be praised. You laid down your life for us that we might be able to enjoy life and life more abundantly. Thou art worthy to be praised, O oh God. Thank you, Lord for making your face shine upon us. We who are unworthy. And Father, we are in a crisis situation, one that you know very well. And so with this knowledge, I beg of you that you would draw nigh to us. 
but rather, Lord, that you would draw us nigh to thee. That you would send forth your word as a sharp two-edged sword. As a hammer to crush the stony heart. That the joy of salvation may be ours today. Remove the dark cloud of deception that the devil has been using to keep us in our filth. Send your holy angels in our midst. Those that are valiant, those that are mighty in battle, oh God. Send them here to be with us, Father. And may they move up and down in our midst, restraining the host of hell. That they might not carry out. The commission that they've been given from the devil this morning. Let none of us be disturbed. None of us distracted. None of us harassed. Set a hedge about this place, O oh God, for this is your sanctuary. May the Son of Righteousness beam in his glory in our presence. And may we see that in Christ there is hope. And now, Father, with no apology, I claim my favorite promise in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. For you said, call upon me. Call upon me, son, and I will answer thee. And I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. O Lord, you know thy servant. Weak. Weak, O God. But you said it. In my weakness, your strength is made perfect. Glorify thy name, O God. And may the dew of heaven fall from my lips, not by my might, nor by my power, but by thy spirit, O Lord of hosts. For this we pray and ask humbly, in the worthy and precious name of Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 13. What book did I say? What book did I say? Chapter 13. And we are going to be reading the word of God this morning. And I'm going to be asking you to pay close attention to every word. The Bible tells us here, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, which means the house of God. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David. Josiah by name, and upon thee shall be offered the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured, up, poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord, thy God, and pray for him that my hand may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, 
If thou wilt give me half of thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of who? Saying, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went ye? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God, and found him sitting under a what? He found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me. And he bred. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of who? Lord. Thou shalt not eat, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he, the old prophet, said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied. So he went back with him, and did eat bread in his house and drink water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but came his back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. The word of God goes on to say in verse 23, And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wait for the prophet for whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way. And the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's just drop down to verse 28. Are you there? And he went and found his carcass, that man of God from Judah, cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. As you read 1 Kings chapter 12 this morning, you saw the situation that was prevailing amongst the people of God. The kingdom of Israel was divided.
Judah was separated from the rest of the tribes. The majority were under the authority of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, realizing that, the people of God would still have to go up to Jerusalem to keep the feast. You know, because the seventh month and the fifteenth day of every year, all the people of God were required to gather together for the Feast of Tabernacles. And that feast was conducted in Jerusalem. And Jeroboam thought to himself, you know something? If I let this go on, maybe the affections of the people will be turned back to Rehoboam. Are you following? So you know something? I don't want the people going to Jerusalem. By the way, that's where the true worship was being conducted. Are you following me? That's where the true worship of the remnant was conducted. Are you following? Oh, Judah was the remnant. You didn't know Judah was the remnant? Oh, the remnant message was in Judah. He says, no, I don't want them going there. Let's set up some golden calves here. Not only are we going to set up some golden calves here and tell the people, Behold, these are your gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt, taking a page out of Aaron's book of apostasy. But he said, I'm going to set up my own feast day, likened unto the one that was carried out in Jerusalem. So instead of doing it in the seventh month, he decided to do it in the eighth, on the 15th day. And it would be similar in some way to the one that was done in Jerusalem. Because if you know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles, it was a time of rejoicing. Because it was symbolic of a time in which all sin was put down and God's people would be dwelling in the presence of the Lamb. No more tears. No more pain. So you can imagine that Jeroboam set up a day of celebration. He set up some celebration worship for the people. Not only that, but according to the book of Leviticus chapter 23, on the Feast of Tabernacles, there were two ceremonial Sabbath days, so he had to set up some false Sabbaths as well because he made it like unto that feast. And those Sabbaths and that feast, they were all connected to paying homage to those gold oxes. Are you following me? Yes. Do you know that those gold oxes were actually the images of sun worship? You mean to tell me that God's people had went after sun worship? That God's people had forced worship established in Bethel, the house of God? Oh yes, brothers and sisters. And not only did they do that, but they went as far to mingle the holy with the profane. Because he said, you know, I'm not going to deal with those Levites. They're true. They're true to the book. Let's get some of these other pliable Joes out here. Some of these unconverted Israelites that will go along with the stratagem. You be the priests of the high place. Oh, brothers and sisters, many men stand with the title of ministers and pastors of the living God. But many men are not ordained by God as ministers and pastors of the true and living God. Some of them are the common folk. Oh no, brothers and sisters. God meets us where we're at. Oh, but he's trying to take us infinitely, 
<laughs> He's trying to take us infinitely beyond what we can comprehend. Oh, I'm going to set up some priests. He mixed the holy with the profane. How did he do it? He was the king, but he was officiating as a priest. your message. Brothers and sisters, when I say peculiar, it doesn't translate in my mind the way it translates in yours. That word peculiar means special. It was a people that were holding on to a special message. And God says, I can't raise up a man in Bethel to rebuke what's going on in Bethel. I gotta raise up a man that's got that remnant message. But who was the man? What was his name? Who was his father? What was his lineage? The Bible doesn't tell us. All we are told is that a man of God came. A tool that the master could use. Oh, brothers and sisters, this man, he was a present truth preacher. Brother, he was a present truth preacher. There was a situation amongst God's people that presently needed to be dealt with. And he had a message that was suited to deal with the crisis for the time. And brethren, when this man spoke, the Spirit of God was with him. Whatever he said according to the word of the Lord, seconds did not elapse before it transpired. Furthermore, brothers and sisters, this brother was a present truth preacher in the fullest. Because he was a medical missionary in the truest sense. He said, what? Oh, this brother was a medical missionary in the truest sense. You know how I know that? When the king stretched out his hand and told his soldiers, lay hold on him. The king's hand withered up. Oh, the Lord shook him with illness. And then he said, seek your God that I might get healed. What did that present truth preacher do? He didn't say, hold on, I gotta get a poultice. He didn't say, let me put some sunlight on that. Let's do a little hydrotherapy. Let me do some hot and cold treatments. Oh, he went to the most important of the eight laws of health, trusting God. He prayed and the king was healed. And we see how the health message there carried out in faith in Jesus Christ and faith as an entering wedge because the same king that wanted him dead because that man was able to provide him with healing he said come into my home that same door that would have not would have, wouldn't have opened unto him when he received healing he said no come into my house now I'll listen to you now brethren he was a present true preacher medical missionary health message was the entering wedge When the king invited him to the house, he said, huh, no, it's okay, can't come. You know why? The Lord told me not to eat bread nor drink water in this place. I can't even go back the same way I came. But the Bible goes on to say, 1 Kings 13, go with me there. Oh, brother. Oh, brother, are you here with me? Yes. Bible tells us in 1 Kings 13. 
that there was an old prophet in Bethel that heard about the mighty exploits that this man of God carried out that day. And he went out looking for this mighty present truth medical missionary. And where did he find him? Word of God says in the book of 1 Kings 13 and 14, and he went after the man of God and found him sitting under a what? Why was this man sitting under an oak tree? Come on now, why was he sitting under the oak tree? Brothers and sisters, it's obvious why he was sitting under the oak tree. The brother was tired. That morning he woke up, he received a commission. He made his way from Judah. He delivered a message. He had to meet the face he beat the king face to face. His life was threatened. Somebody got healed. The brother was tired. And he was certainly hungry. And so he had to sit down and take a rest. Where was he? Under the what? Go with me to Ezekiel. Have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Are you with me? Come on, brother, are you with me? Yes. Ezekiel chapter 6. Ezekiel, the sixth chapter. And let's look at verse 13. We have the same man. The Bible tells us here, Then shall ye know that I am the Lord, when there slain men, shall be among their idols round about their altars. Upon every high hill, in all the tops of the mountains, and under every green tree, and under every thick what? The place where they did offer sweet savor to their idols. Where were they offering sweet savor to their idols? Under the oak tree. Go with me now to the book of Genesis. Come on, brother, and don't get weary with me now. Genesis chapter 35. Genesis, the 35th chapter. Please, when you have it, say amen. amen. Bible says in Genesis 35, beginning at verse 4, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods, which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. What was put under the oak? Their strange gods and their idols. By the way, what was one of their strange gods? Their earrings. How come we're not telling people anymore that jewelry is a part of people's strange God? When it's clearly here in the Bible. How can we not warn people? Oh, you can look to the left or look to the right, but the Word of God is still staring at you. Oh, I love how people try to ignore the Word of God. You won't ignore Him when He's coming in a cloud and folding in and out with a flame of fire. That this is part of idolatry. That it's a species of sin that Christ wants to give us victory over. Yes, you may be deceived. Yes, you may not know it. But hey, before we come to Christ, there's a lot of things that we don't know. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So how come we're not teaching people to fear God? How are you going to dunk a person in the pool with idol on? No, 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 no. How are you going to take him out the pool and say it's okay to put the idol back on now? And all of you that say amen and preach, how come 
you're not being a faithful brother and sister and in love going to your brothers and sisters saying, Brethren, I know you may have not heard this, but I have something I'd like to share with you from the Word of God. Before you try to run around condemn all the preachers and pastors like you're any better. Unfortunately, some of them are fearful of their faces. I praise God. He said he'd make our forehead like splint. He said they're going to have a hard forehead. My servant will make your forehead even harder than theirs. Oh, yes. Those strange gods, where did Jacob place them? Under the oak. Come on, brother, and I understand. I love jewelry. I love jewelry still. But I said, brother, love jewelry still? Yes, I love jewelry still. I am going to bling out in heaven. I'm working on a few more carrots. Sorry, stars. You can keep your, you can keep your gravel. I'll take the real thing. I say gravel because you know we're walking on gold in heaven, don't you? I'll take the real thing, thank you. I'm not oblivious to the taint of sin. Oh, I still bear the marks on my body, brothers and sisters. I carry the tattoos with me, I still have the piercing here. Oh, but I'm going to receive a new body. That's not subject to mortality anymore soon. How about it? Are you willing to wait till the master jeweler places on you the jewelry? Bible goes on to say, go with me to the book of Joshua. Joshua. Joshua, the 39th chapter. What book did I say? I gave you the wrong chapter. Chapter 24. Joshua, chapter 24. Are you there? Bible says beginning at verse. Let's begin at verse 21. We have it say amen. Matter of fact, I want to start at 19. It's just too awesome. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord. For he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods. Then he will turn and do you what? Oh, then he will turn and do you what? Oh, you think our God is a different God today? You continue to serve your strange gods, it says he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statue and an ordinance where? And Joshua wrote these words, in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it, set it up under or rather set it up there under and that was by the sanctuary of the Lord do you see why Joshua set this stone up under the oak it was to stand as a perpetual witness against the children of Israel that they had made a covenant with God that they would serve him and not strange God and he was saying remember if you go back to those strange gods that you used to offer incense to under that oak you see that stone you are worthy of stoning 
condemnation. Hallelujah. Under the old brothers and sisters, there was a history of idolatry in the Bible. Yes. Yes. Could it be possible that this mighty man of God in 1 Kings 13, that this present truth preacher, that this medical missionary had an idol tucked away in his heart? Could it be possible? Go with me back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 13 and verse 18. Please, when you have it, say amen. Look what the Bible says. Matter of fact, start at 17. When you're there, say amen. The Bible says that the man of God said to that old prophet, For it was said to me by the word of who? Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied. But what was this man of God's response? Did he say, no, the Lord told me to do this? Did he say, no, I need to pray about this? Did he say that? Word of God says in verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drink water. And we know the rest of the story, don't we? As he was in the midst of eating this old lying prophet's bread. As he was in the midst of drinking this false prophet's water. The Spirit of God came upon that man. And he prophesied against the man of God. And he told him according to the word of God. That because he had disobeyed the direct command that he had received from the Lord that his carcass would not go into the sepulchers of his fathers. He pronounced judgment on that man's head. But look at the man of God's response. 1 Kings 13. Are you there? 1 Kings 13. And verse 23, after the prophet tells him what his portion will be, the Bible says, and it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him an ass. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let me tell you something right now. I'm going to tell you right now. If I was sitting down at your table, eating your bread, and drinking your water, and you told me, according to the word of God, that I was going to die and not be honored as my father's because of my disobedience, and I knew that my act of disobedience was my submission to you tempting me to disobey the word of God, you can keep your bread and your water. I don't want another job. Yes, sir. Yes. But it says after he had finished eating and after he had finished drinking, then he went. Brothers and sisters, the brother was hungry. <laughs> His appetite yes. mastered him. Yes. And the Bible goes on to say that as a result, as he was going in the way, a lion slew him. And there is dead body laid. Dead body here. Lying over here. 
and the dumbass over here. Now that's got to be a proverb. It's got to be. How many of us brothers and sisters how many of us have started off on the right path? We can see what's taking place in the church of the living God today. We can see that strange worship has been introduced into the house of God. And in our studies, and in our prayer, God says you need to stand up and say something. You need to say something. So the people can turn from their sins and be healed. Oh, brother, it's a hard work. It's a hard work. It's one that will weary a man very quickly without the Spirit of God. It's a hard work. And many of us, we start this path fired up, filled with the Spirit of God. But somewhere along the way, we get tired. Tired. Somewhere along the way, we cease to endure. And there's some idol. Some idol that gains the ascendancy in our hearts. Some idol that is erected in our hearts by which will be the means of our downfall. But when we are rebuked for our sin, when we are reproved for our works of unrighteousness, we do just like that man of God. Continue on our way. Oh, brothers and sisters, when that man of God was reproved, he should have, he should have gotten on his knees and repented. Is not the Lord merciful? Could not have God extended his life for a few more days, given the chance to repent of his sins? Could not the Lord have forgiven him for his transgressions? But oh, brothers and sisters, he refused to acknowledge his sin. No repentance. Didn't even acknowledge the situation. Acted as if it didn't happen. He drowned it in food and water. The Bible says when he left, he was slow, he was slew by a lion. And the lion stood there. The ass stood there. And his body laid there, dead. Oh, brothers and sisters, this has to be a proverb. What does the Bible tell us about lions? Go with me to the book of Nahum. Nahum, I know, I'll give you some time to get there. Because I know, I know, brethren. I know, Nahum. Nahum chapter 2. Nahum chapter 2 and verse 11. What does the Bible say about a lion? The Bible tells us in Nahum chapter 2 and verse 11. Where is the dwelling of the what? And the feeding place of the young lion. Where the lion, even the old lion walked. And the lion's whelp. And none made them afraid. The Bible says that nothing can make a lion afraid. Are you following me? Brothers and sisters, lions are fearless. You didn't hear what I said, did you? Lions have no fear. They're a proud beast. There's no fear in the heart of a lion. What does the Bible tell us about the ass, the donkey? Go with me to Job. Job. What book did I say? Chapter 39. Job, the 39th chapter. 
Beginning at verse 5, please, will you have it say amen? amen. Bible says in Job 39, beginning at verse 5, who has sent out the wild ass free? Or who have loosed the bands of the wild ass? Look at verse 7. He scorneth the multitude of the sea. Neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. Do you know what that means? That the ass does not regard the crying of the driver? The ass could care less about the pleading of the man that's riding him. If the ass is ready to lay down, he ain't moving till he's ready. Because he's a stubborn, stiff-necked beast. Brothers and sisters, oh, what we saw there in 1 Kings 13, it's got to be a proverb. It is a proverb. You know why that man was laying there dead, brothers and sisters? He was laying there because he had a character that was like the lion and the ass. Did you hear that? Yes. He was too proud to acknowledge his sin and fear God. And he was too stiff-necked and stubborn to acknowledge that he was being too proud to acknowledge his sin. So he just laid there dead. You don't get it, do you? Yes. Why isn't the lion eating the ass? Why isn't the lion eating the dead body? Why isn't the ass running from the lion? Because the ass is too stubborn. Brothers and sisters, that's our state. Too proud to acknowledge that we're in sin. Oh, you're rich and increased with goods. You think you have made of nothing, don't you? You don't know that you're wretched, poor, bond, miserable, and naked. Too stubborn and stiff-necked to receive the reproofs of the Lord. You're going to continue in your way. Fine! You stay dead in your sins. That's the condition of God's church. Twixt to obedience. No, in a lukewarm, dead state. Oh, brethren... But it's not just the condition of us as individuals. Brother, this is the condition of us as a church. You see, God has given us a special message. Did you hear what I said? God has given us a special message. This message will lay low the pride of kings. This message will rebuke the apostasy that is in the popular Christian churches of our time? Oh, this message is a special message. It's a present truth message. It's a message that incorporates health reform. Oh, you, didn't, you didn't know God gave us a health message to be an interim wedge? So people can comprehend the high and exalted truths of the three angels' messages? Oh, brother, and it's a powerful message. And as a church, we started out with power preaching this message. Power! No one can gainsay nor resist the pure, undiluted doctrine of God's remnant church because it is the everlasting gospel. This is the message of salvation. This is the truth for this time. Somewhere along the way, brothers and sisters, I think we got tired of giving this message. Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, we got tired of being different. Always having to be the ones that are pushing against the current. Always having to be the different guy in the group. And so when the false prophet comes to us, come on, listen to me now. When the false prophet comes to us, oh, when these preachers from other churches come to us, 
Let me make it plain, huh? When these evangelicals come to us with their purpose-driven lives and their TD Jakes, and they tell us to come and sit down at the table with them, there is a little might left in us. A little might. Because we said, you know what? No. God told me that this is what I'm to do. But in our weariness and in the fact that there are some items in our hearts wanting not to be different, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be like everybody else, wanting to be honored by men. When we hear them tell us, well, an angel told me. He say, well, an angel? That's good enough for me. I mean, maybe I'm not the only prophet. Because like he said, I'm a prophet like you. Come on, you Sabbath keepers. Don't try to act like you're the only ones that got the message. Like there's no other, like these other churches, like we're not following God too. You're the only ones that have the gospel. Don't be so exclusive. arrogant oh we listen to the angel message but my bible tells me in the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8 though we although we or an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have Unto another gospel, which is no other gospel. New theology, new doctrine that says, Come as you are, stay as you are, and by the grace of God, we're going to make it into heaven this way too. Bible says, Let him be a curse. And so we go up to this other gospel. And now we're sitting down at the table with the false prophet eating and drinking. But Lord, my brothers and sisters, God will use a donkey to reprove his prophet. He'll make the stones cry out against the when the rebuke comes to us. Come on now. When the rebuke comes to us as church, as leadership, we're just too proud. Too proud and too stiff-necked. To repent and acknowledge our sin. Come on now. And turn from our wicked ways. The brother and the saint, come on, don't talk like this. We got visitors here. I know they're here. I know they're here. That's why I'm giving this message. Because I want them to know you're in the right place. This church has got the doctrine for the salvation of sinners. had me down in that pit thinking I was doing it because I'm hanging out with all the rappers because I'm writing movies because I'm making money I thought I had it oh 
soul, but when this message came to me, and I understood this truth, you can have it. Give me Jesus. Oh, brethren, you're in the right place. I just want you to know. I just want you to know. As long as we're here on planet Earth, and as long as you have to deal with humanity, there's always going to be sin in the camp. But you're in the right place. Don't let the false gospel distract you. Don't let the little skirmishes distract you. You're in the right place. But there is one message. One. And God is calling us as a people back to the truth. He's calling us to surrender our idols. To come up from under those oak trees. And to endure until the very end. Until we reach home. Oh brothers and sisters, we've got a ways before us. Because many of us thought we were going to enter heaven a long time before now, didn't we? That's why we got weary. That's why you started with the movies again. That's why you started dressing different again. That's why you started keeping company with those friends again. Because you thought you were going to enter a long time before. And you got weary. So you went back to your idols. But now God is calling you to stand back in your first love. has a plan for you. And he has a mighty plan for this great Advent movement. Because this is the movement that will bring this world to an end. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me clarify myself. Because the NSA and the FBI and all of them love to put interesting colorings on your words nowadays. You see this movement? We are going to bring the world to an end. Not by bearing arms. Not by taking force up against the government. But this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world. On every nation for a witness. with the sword of truth, the preaching of the word of God. Yeah. Oh, brethren, I know and believe in my heart God never, never told us the name of that man of God because he wanted you to know that man of God can be you. He wants you to realize your condition. Because Laodicea is just like that man of God. Think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And we realize not that although we have the biggest medical system, although we have all these institutions, although we are a worldwide church, We're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And Jesus is the only answer for the cleansing of our sins. You can run anywhere you want to, brothers and sisters. Go to the Seventh-day Baptist. They don't got it. Trust me, I know. 
Go to the Jehovah Witnesses. They ain't witnessing for Jehovah. They don't got it. Trust me. I know. Study with them brothers too. They're still stuttering to this day because they didn't answer my last question. You can go to the Messianic Jews. They keep the Sabbath. But trust me, they don't got it. You step foot into any one of the Sunday churches. Oh Lord, they have great intentions. But surely they don't got it. Because if you can't acknowledge a clear commandment, we need to go back to the basics. Because no one here is going to say, it's okay to kill. Is it? Please, step up. No one here is going to say, it's okay to commit adultery. But for some curious reason, we can forget what God said, remember. To keep the Sabbath day holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. From Genesis to Revelation, it never changed. They said no, in Revelations, it says the Lord's day, brother. Where does it say Sunday? Last I saw in Revelation, in Exodus 20 and verse 8, the Bible says, for the Sabbath is what the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. So what's the Lord's day? Amen. Man, there's profoundness in simplicity. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is it. This is the movement that has an eternal destiny. But on whose side will you stand? You're going to go after the new worship, the new theology, the spiritual formations. Oh, brother, listen, man. The thing is on the table. You don't want to address what's on the table? It's all out. Oh, are, we going, are we going to cling to Jesus? Are we going to cling to that old time gospel? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, for she hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's time to get back. For all that the faithful and true witness loves. He rebukes and he chastens. He's 
zealous therefore and repent.